Okay, so I'm here with Dr. Paul Kelly today. Hello, Paul. How are you today? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. So, Paul, uh, we haven't met before, but I am aware of you because you are a lecturer and researcher at the University of Edinburgh in physical activity. And so I'm interested to talk to you today about all, your, all you know about physical activity. So if we can get some, some of that knowledge from you today to share with um, people watching this video. So before we start, I wonder if you might be able to just introduce, ourse introduce us to you or introduce yourself to us um, a little bit about who you are and the kind of work that you do. Okay, um, well, thanks. Uh, lovely to meet you, Rachel. Uh, yeah, like you say, I, my name's Paul and I, I'm a lecturer at Edinburgh University. Um, and I teach on a number of degree courses there. So we have a MSc in Physical Activity for Health, which is sort of the epidemiology of the, the health benefits and the psychology and that sort of thing. Um, we have an applied sports science degree um, and we, we teach the sports scientists about the world outside the laboratory and how physical activity can, can be an interesting um, way of uh, you know, improving health and fitness. And we also teach uh, physical education uh, uh, teachers who are doing their training so that when they go to schools, um, they can have a broader understanding of, of um, health and, and what, you know, what might make physical activity more appealing in a physical education class and, you know, not just doing bleep tests and that sort of thing. Um, and increasingly, we're starting to work with the medical students in Edinburgh as well so that they feel more confident when they go out to become GPs or surgeons or... Um, you know, all the different professions they can do that they have an understanding of, of the benefits of physical activity. So half my time is spent teaching and the other half is, is spent doing research. And uh, the, the common theme in my work is how do we measure physical activity? I, I suspect we might go into a bit more detail on that in a bit. Um, but almost all research designs and evidence will require some sort of measurement, um, be it quantitative or qualitative. Um, and, and I'm interested in how do we better understand and interpret those measurements. Excellent. So I didn't realise that you ran so many courses related to physical activity at the University of Edinburgh. So I'm interested to know, it makes me wonder, what are the common themes that run across those courses that you teach to the different sort of sectors that are on those courses? So, you know, the common physical activity themes that we should have knowledge of as healthcare practitioners, or that run across the other sectors as well? Um, that's a great question. Uh, personally, in, in, in my teaching, uh, uh, there's a few things I'll always do. The first is explore what do, what do people know about the health benefits. And, and quite a lot of this information is, is, is in there. It's latent in people's brains. And indeed, often there's a, an idea that it's common sense that physical activity is good for you. So sort of one of the first things we explore is if we all know this stuff and, and we know it's good for you, why is it, why is physical inactivity a, a problem, you know, described as an epidemic globally? Um, what, what are the barriers and uh, things that are preventing people being more physically active? So it's almost opening that, that question that maybe, maybe people haven't asked before, be they medics or physical education students or sports scientists or, or masters or, or, or PhD students. I'll also often or, or almost always explore what is physical activity. So many people will come with a preconception that it's sport um, or that it's going to the gym and, you know, getting sweaty, wearing lycra, uh, invariably in pain. And, and, you know, a lot of people can, can think of physical activity when, when it's in those terms as an unpleasant thing. Um, and what we offer, what we'll do is we'll show data, and and I've got an excellent PhD student called uh, Tessa Strain, who who unpicks these big national surveys to find out what people are actually doing. And when you when you have a, when you look at a breakdown of population physical activity, sport and exercise make up a very small fraction in a very small number of people, almost predominantly sixteen to twenty four year old males. Um, that's where you see most sport and exercise and team sports and what have you, much less in, in females of the same age um, and much less in males and females as they get older. And what you actually see is walking, cycling, physical, act physical activity at work, occupational physical activity, physical activity at the home, so gardening, housework, cleaning, um, and, and that sort of thing. 
So what we do is we explore the idea that physical activity isn't sport. It isn't, doesn't have to be painful. And, and then we ask people, you know, based on these data, based on this new information, what policies and decisions would you make if you were in charge? Um, so regardless of, of the sort of student audience, we, we just try to get them to think about physical activity as a much more broad life course um, sort of series of possibilities than, than maybe what they, they first thought when they walked into the lecture hall. So when you say uh, what would they do if they were in charge, do you mean if they were a leader in their environment, working environment, daily occupational environment, whatever? Um, it's a deliberately um, broad question. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes we'll do case studies and, and we'll do some role play and it might be that they are the head teacher of a local school. It might be that they are a doctor in a, in a GP practice. And, you know, we know that people trust their doctors and the health advice they get there. So there's a, there's a power dynamic. Um, sometimes we ask people to pretend that they're the first minister of Scotland. You know, what would they do about physical activity? So, what, yeah, I guess when I say when they're in charge is if they were in an influential or decision-making role, what would they do with that information? So do you think, um, do you think it's going to take people in those sorts of positions to... I don't want to say reverse, I want to say, uh, let influence is a good word, to influence the sort of trends and the epidemic that we're seeing in physical activity or inactivity. In fact, do you think we need to? Is that, is that something we need to do? And, and does it take, what does it take from those people to do that, do you think? Okay, so, so do we need to reverse the trends in physical inactivity? Yes, I think we do. Um, nice. Easy one, easy question. Um, do I think that to do that will require a change of thinking across society from people in influential positions? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, obviously that's just part of the picture. Um, but I think if you can have systemic change at, at every level of, of society, um, from your interaction with your GP, your interaction with your physical education teacher, your interaction in, in your school, in your home... Um, when you you know, with public transport, um, when you're at the workplace, you know what decisions and and supportive environment has been created, and of course, you know if you happen to be um, in you know in with having physiotherapy, um, you know the interaction that you get there, you know was your physio trained and supported to to give good, um, relevant contextual advice. I think all of those things are needed if we want to see population shifts in physical activity. And I guess, like you started by saying, we all know that physical activity is good for us and we all kind of need to, as healthcare practitioners, and you know, our audience is mainly physiotherapy, but there are others that look at what we do as well. Um, we... I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, so we were. So we need to know the benefit. We all know that physical activity is good for us. We need to be able to voice that, don't we, to the people that we work with as, as healthcare practitioners. So um, what what do we need to understand about physical activity to be able to do that effectively? In in terms of the benefits. Yeah, the benefits and just how we encourage people to be more physically active. Okay, well, let's, let's take on the benefits first. Um, I think that, some t that sometimes we put an emphasis on the health effects that as researchers, academics, um, potentially practitioners and epidemiologists, we think are most important, which might be premature mortality or it might be, you know, 25-year risk of coronary heart disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, these sort of things. And I think we might sometimes forget the benefits which are most relevant to people, um, people, patients, persons. And, you know, I'm not sure how many people make day-to-day -day decisions about a 25-year, you know, hazard ratio or relative risk for a disease, you know, with a confidence interval of this, you know, and a p-value of that. Um, I, I think there's a danger that sometimes we, 
we get in a bit of an echo chamber and talk about things that we all think are important and, and stop thinking about the benefits that might really be of value um, to the people whose physical activity we're trying to influence. So I'm starting to think about, well, what are the mental health benefits and what are the societal uh, or, or social health benefits? You know, and again, when we talk about mental health benefits, do we focus on, you know, avoiding negatives or do we need to have better vocabulary about um, voicing the, the positives? You know, you know, physical activity um, improves mood. You know, physical activity, um, you know, leads to, you know, happiness, you know, half an hour after you finish. You know, um, physical activity, you know, can be a distraction from, you know, stress and worry. Um, and also, you know, physical activity is an opportunity to um, socialize and spend time with friends and family and in the outdoor environment. So I certainly think when we're thinking about the benefits, we could expand our, our view and our vocabulary such that we can start talking about the things that might actually be of value to, to, the, to the people we're speaking, speaking with. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. It, it's, it's a good one when, when, like I say, when we're doing the teaching and, and, and also public engagement, it, it, it seems to be something that resonates. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's providing that training and, and that uh, support so that it isn't just a good idea, it's actually something people feel efficacious to go and do in their, in their practice or in their work. In terms of how do we increase physical activity, um, I, I, I don't mind admitting that I don't think we really know yet. Um, you know, hide behind the classic research, you know, more research is needed, you know, PS, please fund me to do that research. But, I, you know, I do think that um, while we have got very good evidence on the efficacy of physical activity interventions, you know, if you can get someone to take a dose of walking, treadmill running, cycling, weightlifting, you'll see certain benefits. We're not as good on the effectiveness. You know, how do we get people to take that, that, that dose uh, to, to medicalize it, if you will? So, you know, there's increasing evidence. There's a very appealing conceptual framework from Professor Susan Mickey, and it's called the Behavior Change Taxonomy or Behavior Change Technique Taxonomy. Um, where they're trying to understand what are the active ingredients in interventions that help. Is it um, about self-monitoring of behavior, giving people a way of, you know, checking their own progress? Is it about goal setting or, you know, giving action plans? Is it about social comparison? Is it about incentives? So I think that gives us a really good framework to try and understand better. Um, but yeah, at, at the moment, how do we increase physical activity and crucially sustain it, you know, beyond a 12 or a 16 week follow up. Not, not, not so clear. Okay. Difficult. So, so that's a good question that we should all think about, isn't it? So, yeah. So, so ways to do that, we should perhaps brainstorm that. So let's, there are, so there are lots of different techniques to, that you just mentioned to try and increase physical activity. We don't know which is the most effective yet, but let's just say that we have had our, interaction with the individual that we're seeing in our practice or or whatever as a physiotherapist or healthcare professional in any other mean um let's talk about measuring let's say we can encourage them to increase their physical activity um and we've done that with them how do we measure how do you, your work's in measurement and that's where you're interested yes. so so what's the what's your best what's your key message for us as healthcare practitioners to look at measuring the physical activity that our patients or clients are doing um, and how we sort of um, get some good outcomes from that. How, how technical am I allowed to get before everyone turns off? Ooh, you can, okay, you can get as technical as you like, but I want a <laughs> clinical message at the end. <laughs> okay. So the, the work that, that I'm heavily engaged in is better understanding and deconstruction of the terms validity and reliability. It's getting technical. <laughs> um, so when we talk about validity, we often you know, say, oh, my measure's been validated or my test has been validated, but we don't deconstruct what that means. You know, so often in physical activity, we mean I compared it to an accelerometer and there was a 
correlation coefficient with a given p-value? Or I compared it to doubly labeled water. Is that something that you'll have come... Is that... Do I need to explain double labeled water? Okay. So double labeled water is the indirect calorimetry where you drink a, uh, a sort of water that has a carbon radioactive isotope in it. And the more energy you expend over a given time, the more of that water you'll convert into carbon dioxide and exhale. So that when you get remeasured in a, I don't know, x-ray machine or whatever it is, um, at some point down the line, the amount of drop in that radioactive isotope is an illustration of how much energy you've expended. So this is con often considered the gold standard for physical activity, um, which isn't quite right in my opinion because it's the gold standard for carbon dioxide exhalation. But physical activity is a behavior. It's a complex set of behaviors. As, as we spoke about before, it's walking to the shops. It's playing in the playground. It's cycling to work. So there's a lot more to it if you want to understand people's behavior and sort of by extension people's behavior change than knowing how much carbon dioxide they've exhaled or in in the case of an accelerometer how much they've moved their hip in three-dimensional space so i'm interested in what different objective measures and subjective measures can and can't tell us so you know when, when we say objective we we mean something that doesn't rely on human perception or you know, human um, kind of memory. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a passive device that, you know, you can sit on your hip or your wrist or, you know, wherever and happily sits there counting objective parameters, be they movement or heart rate or these sort of things. And then the subjective is, is you know, when you ask someone. Um, and there's many ways of asking people about their activity. You can ask them to keep a diary. You can ask them to remember what they did um, you know, over the last four weeks, you can ask them what they normally do. You can do it with a mobile phone, face-to-face, -face, pen and paper, computer-assisted interviews, telephone-assisted interviews. So, you know, again, self self-report, subjective measures don't just tell you one thing. You know, they, they have different strengths and weaknesses. So, a lot of my work is is trying to, instead of saying what measures the best, what's next, which one can I afford. It's, well, here's a, here's a vast array of measures, the objective and the subjective, which one is most appropriate for my research question. So if you're, you know, working in physiotherapy and what you're trying to do is increase someone's, let's say, functional mobility through walking, you know, the, the best thing might be um, a pedometer. You know, you don't need a fancy, anything fancy than that. You know, if the number of steps have gone up, that's a very good indication that there's been an improvement in functional mobility. If actually what you're really trying to improve is their social connectedness and their opportunities to go out into the community, you know, is it, can they get to the corner shop? Can they, um, you know, um, you know, get to the cafe or, you know, whatever it is that they value, then, you know, self-report could be very good because, you know, someone, you don't, you know, someone can, knows whether or not they, they went to the shop yesterday. Um, so, you know, you can save a lot of money on expensive devices um, if you have a better understanding of what your research question is and what the different measures offer you. Or it may just be a clinical question that you're, that's coming out of the assessment with your, with the interaction with your patient or your client. Yeah. Yeah. So those are good measures. Those are good measures to take into clinical, the clinical situation. Definitely. And, and is there anything, I don't suppose you've particularly done any work with physiotherapy in particular or any other, sort of health uh, clinical situations? We, I'm involved in one um, trial with um, some research physiotherapists who are based at the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre in Oxford. Um, and the principal investigator is called Dr. Catherine Minsler. And I think we're at stage two now, and, and we're trying to see if including walking um, in physiotherapy care um, post, I think it's post-surgery for lower back, what would we say, lumbar? Low back pain. Low back pain. Yeah. Um, it, is it, does increase, does in, including walking 
with the with the physio care, the, the normal care, lead to better outcomes than just the, 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 the normal standard oh, physio care. Yeah. So we um, like I say, we we've 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 run our first pilot and we we've got you know various outcome measures. So is it the six minute walk test is the classic yes. Classic one physio, um, and we've, we're using pedometers to see if functional ability is increasing, and we're also using a, a daily activities questionnaire to see which behaviours might have, might or might not have been influenced. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as, as I speak, the the data are being analysed, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll we'll know whether or not we we did show a positive effect pretty soon. Good. Well, I look, we look forward to seeing those results. I hope you'll let us know when they come out so that we can share them with everyone. Um, Okay, so we've talked about a fair bit. We've covered quite a range of physical activity sort of topics there. Now, I'm, I fully admit I'm no physical activity expert in the field of public health. So is there anything, are there any messages or any key points that I haven't, we haven't discussed today that sort of um, are, are things that we, we as practitioners or clinicians should be thinking about um, to take to improve this you know physical activity or to reduce physical activity to increase physical activity in our populations that we work with well if, if it hasn't come up yet i i definitely recommend consulting the chief medical officer infographic on physical activity um i think this is an incredibly powerful um and useful tool when you're speaking with the public um, or, or your patients, because it's it's a single sheet of A4 paper, and it's a very clear message um, that can be used to open the conversation about physical activity. So I, I think familiarization with that, with the 150 minutes message, and with the specific advice of, of how that could be accumulated in the infographic um, would be an invaluable um, first step uh, for practitioners. What I'd add to that is, you know, combine that with your, you know, with your own experience and expertise, you know, not as, you know, I don't have to tell you that not every patient is the same and not every patient's physical activity, their physical activity, literacy, their capabilities, and their, what they value will be the same either. So it's about being able to give relevant and specific, um, you know, advice at a, at an individual patient level, you know, we have the message that, that, that my research center use, uses, which is, you know, sit less, walk more. So don't be obsessed with you only get benefits if you reach 150 minutes a week. The, the first message should be, can you sit a bit less and, and walk a bit more? Can you sit a bit less and move a bit more? If you're currently doing 17 minutes a week, can you make that 25? There'll be benefits. Can you then make that 35, 40? So while using the the infographic and the chief medical officer message as a very powerful tool don't be afraid to use your own expertise and judgment as well to to, to give contextual and relevant advice yeah i think um and it also sounds like the way you've answered that question um indicates that you advocate for giving a simple message as well um so i think yeah it seems like you know we as clinicians or practitioners or whoever um whoever we are that is working in this environment or in this way, need to have a good understanding of physical activity and the epidemiology and everything behind it. But we don't need to share that with the people that we're interacting with necessarily. We need to keep the messages simple, don't we? Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. That I would agree with that. That, that would be um, my, my stance as well, yes. Yeah, good. Now, I know... Um, Currently, as I'm talking, you're also running a free open online course at the University of Edinburgh, aren't you? Um, and, and we've just been chatting before we started recording that we think it's a it's a quite a different course to the um, physical activity course that we are running at Physiopedia, and we believe that they may complement each other very well. So, um, can you just tell us a little bit about the course that you're running, um, so that? Um, individuals and we believe it will run again later in the year so that people who have done our course could um, go on and do that one as well yeah um, yeah so Rachel I mean my understanding is that largely your course is aimed at practitioners and sort of upskilling 
and, and capacity building in, in, a, in a practice sense. And I suppose, yeah, I would view ours as, as complementary because we're maybe aimed one more step downstream at um, sh you know, the general public, at, at people, um, and trying to give them strategies and techniques and confidence to increase their own physical activity. So, you know, we, we joked earlier about being too technical. You know, we've, we've had all of the technical jargon banned from, from our, our movie. Um, and we have, you know, just various modules. Um, so I'm involved in the one about measuring your own physical activity, which is relevant to setting smart goals. You know, you know if you set yourself a physical activity target, make sure it's measurable. So, you know, if you reached it, but, you know, we have um, modules on physical activity um, in, you know, different urban and school environments, the physical activity during pregnancy, which I think is a very important topic. Um, and, you know, strategies for becoming more physically active. And yeah, so I think there's, there's three weeks of, of modules and then there's various quizzes and sort of extra activities you can get involved with um, in the course of the MOOC. So uh, sort of as, as, as you said before, it, either it would be useful or interesting for your um, MOOC um, sort of uh, participants to, to have a look at, or it might be a really good place for them to steer their their patients and the people they're working with if they want more you know interactive um information about physical activity definitely so um so yeah it sounds like it's a it's aimed at a different sort of participant set and i think mm -hmm. um i think it'd be really useful though for us to to have a look at that course as well um so what we will do is add a link i'll definitely provide a link to that so that people can have a look at that as well um is there anything else that we haven't covered, I haven't asked you, that you would like to say to the people that might be watching this video? <laughs> um, thanks for watching. Um, you know, delighted that the, there's an interest in, in physical activity. Um, you know, and sort of touching on that, that point at the start is, you know, as a, myself as a physical activity researcher, that there's only so much that, you know, me or my field can do to, to increase physical activity. And it's, it's only through the engagement of, you know, physiotherapists, doctors, teachers, um, who actually interact, you know, with the public that I think we'll start to see those shifts. So, you know, delighted that your, your MOOC's taking place and, and, and good luck to all your participants in, in, in using physical activity in their work. Excellent. Um, I think there's some really good messages that have come out of that um, conversation with you today. Um, we're very grateful for your time. Thank you so much for talking to us. And we look forward to seeing all your work published on physical activity in the future. <laughs> Thanks.